Good evening, everyone. This is Ryan Hoyme, a.k.a. Massage Nerd. And this show is brought to you by our friends at Massage Magazine Insurance Plus. Massage Magazine has been exploring touch therapies for over 25 years and has used that industry knowledge to develop the best value liability insurance in the business. Welcome, everyone. This is Ryan Hoyme, a.k.a. Massage Nerd. And tonight we have a special guest, Rebecca Sturgeon. Welcome, Rebecca. Hi. Yeah. So um, let's get a little background on you. So how did you get involved in the massage industry and what got you started? And Oh my goodness. Um, do you want it chronological or dramatic? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever's more fun, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I came to massage later after multiple career changes. Um, you know, I was an academic for a while, I was a computer programmer, worked in nonprofits. Um, and what ultimately led me to, to take the leap um, is finding the people that I wanted to work with. And initially, that was um, geriatric. I worked in um, senior living communities for several years and had been thinking about massage therapy in the back of my mind for several years as well. Um, and just kind of seeing people who were isolated for no good reason and how important just touching someone, just touching someone on the back as you said hello to them seemed to be. Um, that was the final push I needed, so I went to massage school um, a little bit later in life and uh, just haven't looked back since. <laughs> Not at all then, right? <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> I, don't, I don't miss anything about the whole corporate thing. No. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what most massage therapists say too. Even though they might not be making as much and stuff, they're still really happy with the, the choice they actually chose then. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and why did you decide to uh, move to uh, Illinois then? Well, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> for a boy, you know. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's not, um, it's not that exciting. But yeah, for that and for graduate school. Um, and neither of those took, unfortunately. Yeah. But is a great city, and I fell in love with it, so I decided to stay. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and, and how did you develop your love for oncology and massage then? Um, it was kind of an accident. Um, it was one of those things that we talked about in school. We had, like, the one day on cancer and massage in school. And I thought... Uh, I thought, well, this is really interesting because I like science, um, but I was so focused on geriatric massage that I didn't even think about it. And then uh, my first job out of massage school, I worked at a spa just to touch bodies and get experience. And they um, brought in someone, Isabel Adkins, actually. They brought her in to do an oncology massage training and asked if I would be interested. And I jumped at the chance because um, it was pretty clear early on that spa massage was not my thing. I could do it, but it wasn't my thing. Um, and this seemed like a, uh, an opportunity to do something that was more like my thing. So I took the oncology massage class and ended up working through the spa at an integrative cancer treatment center um, for a long time. Um, and just through that, met a lot of wonderful people. Um, and realized that the thing about oncology massage that draws me, there are many things, but the main thing was this was the perfect combination of science and research and really in-depth um, medical knowledge and just pure compassion um, and a really challenging level of compassion. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, because um, back in the um, mid '90s and stuff, when I went through massage school, I mean, I mean, cancer, um, cancer and massage were you never spoke about it basically and stuff. And if you did, oh, make sure you get a doctor's um, pres um, prescription and everything else and stuff like that. But things have changed so much. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And w when did you notice that it started really switching? That it's it's not as dangerous and stuff to get get a massage. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of because I went to massage school a little bit after you did. By the time I went to school, um, we all kind of knew that, you know, massage doesn't spread cancer and you can massage people with cancer. Um, but I think within the past five years, as um, massage therapists have become more educated about oncology and oncology massage and have started to develop trainings for each other, um, 
I mean, we have these these uh, leaders in the field now, and now it's an actual field. We have like Gail McDonald, and Tracy Walton, Isabel Atkins. We have organizations that um, have developed and standardized training, and I think that's been within like the past five, six years that that's really mushroomed, and people have come together to standardize the practice um, so that it's it's um, oncology massage is a field that can be trusted more. Um, I think it could always be trusted, but there's uh, more of a national standard that can be trusted around the country as well. Yep. And are they starting to bring it more into hospitals, would you say? I think so. Um, I'm seeing it around here, and I'm seeing it as I um, kind of talk to people in other medical professions around here that um, people aren't as surprised about it, and I, don't, I feel like I don't have to explain myself quite so much. Um, or I don't have to explain what I do quite so much. It's more about explaining why I'm qualified to do what I do. Um, so I think that there's there's more awareness of it, and there's more an acceptance that this is um, not only safe but also materially beneficial um, to, especially to people who are currently in cancer treatment. Yeah, definitely. Because and, and um, have you noticed that doctors are more accepting of it too and stuff for massage with cancer patients or? Absolutely, yeah. and I still see a little bit of a gap. Um, a little bit of a drop off depending on, um, I'm trying to think of how to say this in the most positive way. Um, <laughs> yeah. Depending on when someone attended medical school, let's say. Because um, yeah. there's, there's still, it's, it, this is probably a, a stereotype and a prejudice on my part, but um, if I'm going into a physician's office and they are of a certain vintage, um, then nine times out of ten I know I'm going to need to explain what I do more, um, but I think especially um, people who are in medical school now, um, physicians who haven't been practicing for that long, it's kind of a given that this is um, something that they can recommend to their patients, that they can look for, um, and that they're sort of demanding of us um, that we have proper training, which is good and right, and they should be. Yes, definitely, because the, the more we work together, the more everybody can be helped out from it, too, and stuff. And, yeah. 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 And, and um, have you heard anything about uh, Obamacare and stuff like that, um, how that's going to affect a massage um, or anything like that? Or? Yeah, um, we've been talking about it and um, doing a few little lunch and learn kind of sessions about it. Um, Honestly, uh, most of what I've been hearing has been sort of fear-based negative, um, and I don't know if that's just Illinois where I am, but um, I think uh, anyone who has worked with insurance before, I have not, but anyone who has worked with insurance before, it's been a difficult process, and they're not very, uh, the people I've met at least haven't been very trusting of this because of um, insurance experiences in the past. Um, but people who have not worked with insurance and don't have that bad experience to color their opinion um, are seeing this as, even if we don't use it as a way to bill patients or clients, um, are seeing this as a way to continue to legitimize massage therapy as part of medical wellness health care. Yeah, definitely. Because um, the thing is, I, I hope it will help massa the massage industry in a way and to get more reimbursed, especially in hospitals and stuff like that. It will, Absolutely. I mean, especially with cancer patients, too, and stuff. And it would be huge. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear one thing from one person, another thing from another, but it's just, I guess it's just a wait and see kind of thing. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's new, and it's it's clearly has some kinks that need to be worked out. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but eventually, and it's also, I think this kind of puts the burden on us, or the, the happy burden on us, that we need to um, make sure that we have our information together, that we continue to do research in the field and present that and write it up and make that a priority in the profession, um, as it hasn't been yeah. in the past. Yep. And, and are there certifications and stuff for oncology massage then? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a broad question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are. Um, 
their uh, Society for Oncology Massage is um, working on, um, or has been working on in the past, uh, a standard for certification, like a national standard for oncology massage certification. Um, there are a couple of different excellent, excellent teachers who offer their own certification programs, like I know Gail McDonald has one, Isabel Atkins has one, and I think Tracy Walton has one as well, I'm not sure about that. Um, all excellent programs um, that offer a wealth of information, um, but they're slightly different. Each one has a slightly different approach. What does exist is um, a minimum um, education requirement to be an approved provider for this and a Society for Oncology Massage, um, which is a minimum 24-hour continuing education course that is offered by one of their approved education providers. Um, and there's education providers throughout the country. There's the organization that I'm involved with, which is called Greet the Day. Um, they're based in California, but they travel, their instructors travel all over the country. Um, there's all the people who I mentioned before, and their website has a, an extensive list of instructors and improved, approved classes and so forth. Yeah, and, and their conferences are just amazing too and stuff. And uh, Yeah, we were talking yeah. about the, the conference in April. It's, you can just meet so many people in the field and just learn a ton, like with any conference. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and the nice thing is there's not hundreds and hundreds of people there kind of thing, so you can get more of that um, hands-on attention and stuff with everything too, so uh, there's a few hundred people probably at least and stuff like that, but that's, I mean, there's a lot of classes going on, so you got your pick of everything, so. Yeah, yeah, and it is, you're right, it is, it's, it's growing. I think this past year was the largest uh, summit they'd ever had, um, but it's still small enough that you can really connect with people and people in your area as well. Yep, yeah. and the nice thing is it's been in my home state the last two times, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the problem is we never get any, we never get anything up here, so. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> And and what and on what kind of things are the uh, is on ecology um, society um, actually working on then? Um, well, yeah. <laughs> they do a lot actually. They have. Um, let me. Can I plug their website? Real yep. Quick? It's S four O M. So letter S number four, letter O letter M dot org. Um, and on their website, they have, in addition to the, the list of classes um, and approved education providers, which I mentioned earlier, um, they have a therapist locator service for clients, potential clients and patients. Um, they have information for medical professionals who may have questions about oncology massage. And they also have a wealth of marketing materials for um, massage therapists who are working in oncology massage. They have um, handouts um, and flyers that are geared to patients that you can print out and use. Um, they have handouts and flyers that are geared to medical professionals as well. Um, and they are, have worked on and uh, written up a standards of practice for oncology massage. Um, so like any professional organization, they've established sort of the definition of oncology massage and the standard um, level of education um, in order to practice this, the standards of knowledge for this, and are continuing to work on a national certification that would be a more extensive training. Yeah, the nice thing is it's attainable compared to some certifications. It's hundreds and hundreds of hours and stuff like that. I mean, some 500, some 1,000 I've seen and stuff for certain just styles of massage and stuff for certification, so. Yeah. Yeah, the, the minimum of, of the 24 hours is definitely attainable for a basic level of knowledge. Um, I think the, the final certification, when that's done and agreed upon, um, will certainly be more extensive, but would involve, I suspect that it would involve a lot of um, hands-on clinical time as well as classroom time. Yep. Yeah, because that's where you learn the most, too, it seems, too, and stuff you get. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and you worked in a hospital before, right? 
I worked in an integrated cancer treatment center. So it was um, not associated with a hospital. Um, it was all outpatient, and they just did um, chemotherapy treatments there as well as the complementary treatments um, that, that, that people had. Everyone had a comprehensive program, um, but they didn't do things like surgery or radiation treatments there. Okay, and you were a massage therapist there then, right? Right. And, yep. Yes. Yeah, it's so nice that those places hire massage therapists and stuff. And yeah, yeah, this was. Um, I think it's it's a fairly still uh, sadly unusual. Um, I mean, I think it's the future of medicine. This integrative approach. Um, their approach was that every patient in the center um, not only had access to the traditional treatments, the chemotherapy, um, and all of that, but they were um, had access to um, a dietitian who would take them through. Um, a healthy eating plan to, to support their um, cancer treatment. They had access to um, a psychologist or social worker who would work with them emotionally. Um, there was a massage therapist, me and the other therapist who worked there. They had yoga therapy, um, some Eastern modalities, physical therapy. It was really, um, it's really a, an excellent approach, I think, to, to treat the whole person and, and their whole life in support of moving them to wellness. Oh, wow. and, and what, what kind of things do you think they could eventually improve on and what, what are some positive things that you saw there too? And um, I think... And you don't have to knock your past employer, so, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think they could improve on... There still seems to be this, this um, sort of pedestal that the that the MD physician is put on. And I completely understand and respect the fact that an oncologist, a hematologist oncologist, an oncologist and an MD has a ton of more training and knowledge than I do. Absolutely. Um, about oncology. Um, but I have more knowledge about massage. And, um, you know, I, I read research too. So yeah. <laughs> um, this, you can see that this was this was a little bit of a sticking point. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the general um, idea of uh, it's kind of an old school idea that that um, this this hierarchical idea that doesn't exist everywhere, but it, it kind of existed there, and I think that that's something that healthcare needs to kind of get over itself about. Um, so that we can all play together because it's all, at the end of the day, it is all about the patient and the patient's current um, treatment process, where they are in that treatment process. And It'll just be a moment. All right. Sorry, I lost you there for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to be my job, but it's not my job anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, what what are some positive, more positive things and stuff you've? Um, the positive is is the the working together with people who are trained in a different way and whose approach to patient care is different, and learning from them, um, and the really the sharing of knowledge uh, because we all have this different knowledge base. And we all have this different information. Um, and I don't necessarily need to know everything that the nurses know, uh, but because this is how my mind works, it's fun for me to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and it's fun for them to know what I do. Uh, so I think that that was really positive. And I think it was positive for the patients as well to feel like they're at this particular center, because it was integrative. 
that um, it wasn't just about pumping chemo in their court. It was about their whole self and their whole support system and being a part of that whole support system that was supporting them as a human who wanted to, to um, remain alive <laughs> and um, not have cancer anymore. And, and was it hard to get a job there? Did you have to go through a lot of interviews and stuff too? And um, for me, it was it was not hard <laughs> <laughs> because I, I kind of um, got this opportunity. Um, the way so many things happen, it just kind of fell out of the universe on me. Um, I was working for a spa, and they brought in Isabel Atkins to do the twenty four hour um, oncology massage training for whoever was interested. So I took the training. Um, and then the spa got the contract with this medical center to provide their massage therapy services. Um, so they, uh, all of us who had taken the training were eligible to work there. And at first we were all working there and then eventually people sort of dropped off for various reasons. They either left the spa or they realized the day-to-day -day work wasn't something they were ready to manage. Um, and from the first day, it's I just kept asking them, can I go more? I want more days. If somebody leaves, give me their day. I want to be there. <laughs> um, <laughs> because that's, it was the, the spa work um, is not what I'm best at. And the oncology massage work, it was kind of immediately clear that, that was, I was a lot better at that. Um, so you kind of wanted to go towards that, and it, and it made me happier. Yeah, definitely. And and what kind of precautions do you have to take with um, cancer patients and stuff? And um, there's there's a lot of different things. You have to. Um, I'm trying to organize my thought here. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be aware of where they are in their treatment process, and um, first of all, recognize that their treatment process includes a period of time after they've actually finished treatment. Um, so, um, asking first of all about lymph nodes, I think is something, that's something that I try to, I teach some basic massage students, um, and when we talk about cancer, i that's one thing that I try to teach them, so they don't have the oncology class, but at least they're asking about lymph nodes and they have an idea of how to adapt, um, because of the lymph node removal in a certain quadrant affects the direction that you can do strokes and the amount of pressure that you can put on that area so as not to trigger lymphedema. Um, so we have to adapt for that with pressure, with direction. Um, we also have to adapt, um, have precautions and adaptations regarding positioning. Um, so an awareness of what, um, where the, the cancer is in the body and what kind of surgeries or other complications or radiation they may have had um, to, to treat the cancer um, if they have any medical devices. We also, I think, have to be very cautious um, and, and ask questions about, um, about blood counts, um, especially if someone is going through chemotherapy treatment because chemotherapy affects blood counts um, in somewhat predictable ways, but everyone is an individual. Um, so. Most people who are going through cancer treatment will know <laughs> if they have like a low white count, low red count, or low platelets. Um, so um, asking that question is not unusual because they're usually getting their blood tested every time they get chemo. Um, and uh, also, I think something that we don't talk about a whole lot, but um, is also important, is being aware and really mindful, even more so than we would be for our quote-unquote regular clients, of what we say and how we say it. Um, one of the teachers for Greet, Greet the Day, um, Jackie Sellers, puts it really well that um, you don't necessarily want to ask someone who's going through cancer treatment how they are. How are you today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I threw up for three hours. You know, it's not necessarily, um, and they don't necessarily want uh, someone to be hyper cheerful because that can be annoying. 
Um, <laughs> if, you, if you're going, and this is this is a place that we go to. Um, I think as um, massage therapists, anyone who's working with a person who has a chronic illness or debilitating illness like cancer, AIDS, anything, that we um, tend to go to that hyper cheerful place as a way to protect ourselves from our own fear. Um, and people can sense that pretty well right off. Um, and don't respond well to yeah. it, necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that there's a lot of, there's precautions regarding um, how the treatment is affecting their body, like blood counts, like lymph node removals, um, surgical scars, medical devices. Um, and there's precautions or, or extra mindfulness in our approach um, that we're not um, massaging Cancer, or massaging, you know, Joan or Jane or Billy or whoever it is, um, and just adapting for this, um, what their challenge is today. Yep, definitely. Yeah, because um, I mean, if they're really like throwing up and vomiting and stuff like that, it's probably not a good idea to give them a massage then during that time, or. Well, you can you can adapt to positioning um, if your your client patient is comfortable. Um, I have worked with people um, in there at the cancer treatment center. Everyone has a recliner that they sit in when they receive chemo, and sitting in their recliners. And sometimes, um, if someone is able and willing to receive touch, sometimes the massage can really help with the nausea. Um, we obviously wouldn't be doing like abdominal massage or rocking and jostling. Or yeah. <laughs> Um, mm. <laughs> me doing that with someone who's in active treatment, period. Um, I wouldn't. But uh, a gentle touch, um, therapeutic holding, um, just holding someone's feet. Um, I've worked with people who are, uh, whose bodies are in such a state that when I first got out of massage school, I would have thought, there's no way I can touch this person. But uh, you learn in oncology massage training and through doing this work that there are countless ways you can touch a person with intention, um, with therapeutic intention that are therapeutically beneficial. Even someone who's experiencing nausea, vomiting, even someone who has jaundice so bad they look like a highlighter, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, that, that um, adapting our pacing and adapting our um, mindset as well. Um, new massage therapists and some experienced massage therapists tend to think in terms of goal. You know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to clear this trigger point, whatever it is. Um, but I think letting go of that mindset and thinking in, less in terms of goal and more in terms of being um, can help us to approach anyone where they are. And expanding our definition of what massage is. Um, I tell my students all the time, this, if you are with someone and they want to receive touch, but the only touch their body can handle right now is you um, cupping their heels in your hands like this and just sitting there with intention and breathing with them, that's massage. Um, it doesn't look like what you did in your clinical class, but that's massage. That's touch with therapeutic intention. Yeah, and, and is the main thing just to more relaxation too and stuff? Um, it's more about relaxation. Um, it's it's more about uh, presence and like a moment of normalcy in the midst of um, speaking of people who are in active treatment in the midst of everything else that's going on. There are also some um, proven benefits that massage has. It can help with fatigue. Um, it can help with nausea. Um, there's preliminary um, studies that you may have seen at the conference that um, show some possible positive effects of massage on peripheral neuropathy. Um, can't say that definitely yet, but um, it can certainly feel good. Um, and it can, it can also <clears throat> pardon me, um, help to manage other side effects of treatment like pain, 
um, and the things that I've mentioned before as well. Yeah. And um, back in the day, I remember hearing about lymphoma, and that's the one to take a little bit more precautions with and stuff. Is that still true these days? And um, it is, but I, I wouldn't say you know that that's lymphoma in particular is is one to be more cautious of than any other type of cancer. Um, I mean, being a blood cancer like leukemia or um, Hodgkin's or anything like that, um, it's certainly systemic. It can have solid tumors as well. Um, I think you would take the same precautions that you would or I would take the same precautions that I would for any type of cancer um, and just get as much information as possible about how, what the patient's experience of this particular disease is, um, what, if any, treatment they have received and are receiving, um, and how that treatment affects their body. Um, and use that along with knowledge of adaptations for pressure, positioning, um, pace, uh, wear, and massage um, to create create a safe massage session. You can still do that for lymphoma. Okay, that that's good to know and stuff like that. So, yeah, and um. And, and then also um, with uh, a cancer patients and stuff like that, where, where are there more aches and pains, would you say? Where in the body? Yeah. Um, that is a good question. I see a lot of breast cancer patients. So there's a lot, a lot of shoulder girdle stuff um, because if someone's had surgery, that's where the surgery is. <laughs> even if they haven't, even if the, the surgery is... Um, well, I don't think there's any such thing as a minor surgery, but even if the surgery was small... Um, there's a lot of sort of protective posture that happens. So um, there's a lot of range of motion issues in the shoulder and some related issues that go up to the neck and the lower back as well. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, with people who have had ports, um, central line ports that are generally installed in the, in the chest wall, I see a lot of... Um, during treatment and after treatment, a lot of upper cross syndrome, kind of upper quarter syndrome kind of patterns. Because what happens commonly with a medical device is, you know, it's a foreign object. And even though it's pretty stable and people get used to it being there, um, unconsciously they're still protective of it. Because there's this thing in their body that's a foreign object and there's scar tissue around it. Um, and it's a little odd and painful. So a lot of this folding in happens. Um, and I saw a lot of, um, no matter where the, the cancer was, uh, neck tension, neck and shoulder tension, which I think is related to, to stress and anxiety, um, which is certainly understandable with the, with the diagnosis that um, you're under sustained stress and anxiety um, for a long period of time. So this happens. I'm exaggerating, but this yeah. happened. Um, yeah. And a lot of times people would not even know that they were doing this for hours on end, possibly sometimes even the entire time they were awake and conscious. This is what the body was doing. Um, so a lot of tension in heads and necks. Um, and... Yeah, that was the most common was a lot of really shoulder girdle and up um, kind of issues, but a, a lot of that has to do with um, most of the people that I saw were breast cancer patients. Okay. And, and what kind of positions um, do you massage them in usually? Um, for people who were receiving treatment, and I would massage at the cancer treatment center, massage people who were actively receiving chemo. They were connected to a line while I was giving them a massage. Um, so... Uh, um, depending on what was going on in their body, I used Prunes supine sideline in a recliner. Um, it all depended on where their tumor was, first of all. Um, and we had some patients who had gastric tumors in the abdomen, so I would never put those people prone. Um, what, how they felt that day. Um, obviously, if someone was super nauseous, they were probably going to stay in the recliner a little bit upright, <laughs> and um, we'd do a nice foot massage. Um, and 
uh, just where they were feeling pain. I use sideline a lot with people um, because it's a very comfortable position. It's very easy on the heart and the circulatory system. Yep. <clears throat> and, and have you seen many uh, radiation burns then? Um, <laughs> I was told never to call them burns. Um, <laughs> it's, I, I, I have seen a few. Um, the ones that I, uh, again, and with mostly um, breast cancer patients, um, so there were some women who were just a little modest about that area because the burns would be on breast tissue. Um, but the ones who were um, open about whatever, um, I've seen some pretty, some pretty, some pretty bad ones actually. Um, what they call um, wet desk formation, which is basically an open sort of seeping kind of thing. Oh. Sorry, yeah. I'm eating dinner. Um, yeah, but, um, back in the day when I worked in nursing homes, I would see people with bed sores, even um, the size of a fist, getting bigger sometimes too. And yeah, it's um, it's really if you let it, it can be very um, debilitating to yourself as a therapist because we can't do anything with that. Yeah. This is it, the, clearly this is someone who is suffering, um, and we can't do anything with that. Because it's outside our scope of practice, but we have to kind of let that go and say, okay, I can't do anything with that, but look at these hundred other things I can do. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and and um, uh, for um, ca cancer and stuff like that, is there any kind of cancer treatments that um, it could actually be transmitted to the therapist too? Then and. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that. I love that you're asking that question. It's yeah. a little bit of a. It's a little, not controversial, but there's still a question, and I'm reaching for my book right now so that I get the name of this chemo right. Okay. <laughs> but there's a there's a certain type of, of chemo that is most chemotherapy drugs are excreted through urine and feces. Um, but there's a certain type, a couple of different chemotherapy drugs that they have shown that comes through the skin. Through sweat, through sweat glands. Um, so there's some places that recommend that if you work with someone who is t who is taking one of these two drugs, one of them is Theotepa, which is very rare um, and usually only used in um, leukemia uh, before um, bone marrow transplants. Uh, there are some places that recommend if you come across one of these these chemotherapies that you um, use gloves. Personally, I never use gloves, ever, unless I had a cut on my hand, um, because immune suppression is a thing. Um, the, but um, these particular drugs, um, there's a small chance that you could come in contact with it. But the thing about them is that they, my understanding, is that um, they start to come through the skin hours after chemotherapy treatment is done, after chemotherapy treatment is done, and for the next 24 hours. And when I was massaging people who were receiving this particular drug, because the name escapes me right now, I apologize, um, I think it's cytoxin. I was always massaging them while they were receiving the drug. So there was minimal chance that I would come in contact with, with anything. Um, it's one of those things that I think um, the therapists need to educate themselves about, get as much information as possible, and make your best decision. Um, I, for me, the best decision was never to wear gloves unless there was something on my skin that could um, be a danger to someone who was immune suppressed. And that had to do with just the humanity of skin-to-skin -skin contact um, and the danger, any potential danger to me of getting chemo um, was really zero to extremely minimal. Okay. 
Yeah, because <clears throat> back in the day when I worked at one of the massage schools, so we'd actually bring them to um, an AIDS HIV um, group home um, every yeah. three months and stuff like that, and you now tell them beforehand that you're not going to wear gloves unless you have <clears throat> open areas and stuff like that, and and they're all freaking out and stuff like that. But once they started doing it, they actually started. Some of them even went back there and started volunteering and stuff. And, <laughs> yeah, because th things have changed so much over the time and stuff. So. <laughs> And and what, what kind of myths um, are still out there about um, massage, massage or even cancer and stuff? Um, I still hear, and it still baffles me. I don't hear this much, but I do still hear, well, won't that spread it? Um, and that's usually when I'm doing community education. I don't really hear that from medical professionals anymore, thank goodness. Um, so that's there's still that fear. Um, that massage spreads cancer, which is impossible based on my understanding of how cancer works um, and what massage does to the body. <laughs> um, there, a lot of the, the myths that I hear also have to do with um, what is safe after cancer treatment. Um, it's not. It's more more of an attitude than a myth, I think. Uh, we uh, recently came across someone who was a breast cancer survivor and her attitude, um, which I'm not saying is bad, but which is very common, was, yeah, I had this breast cancer thing and now I'm done with it and I don't need to think about it anymore. Well, she had lymph nodes removed, so she kind of does need to think about it every time she gets a massage. Um, it's a hard message for someone to hear who, you know, had this cancer thing and they're done with it and they beat it and are ready to have that not be a part of their life anymore. Um, but it is something that affects and changes your body for the rest of your life. Um, so there's there's an attitude that, okay, I, I had cancer, I beat cancer, I don't ever have to think about it ever again. But you kind of do. Yeah, and, and I can definitely uh, speak from experience too. My, um, five years ago, my dad had prostate cancer. And then a year ago, he um, got he had his whole prostate removed, and then a year ago, it's um, his numbers started elevating again and stuff like that. So oh they up there just keep keep an eye on that and stuff like that too. It's they're they're thinking they didn't get it all and stuff like that. That's what they're thinking. So they might have to go back in there. And, so yeah. You know. And then and then yeah. um and then where where yeah, can people that get? Would be so frustrating. Yeah, and wh where can people get um, the studies and stuff out there on cancer and stuff? And do you, uh, do you know off the top of your head? Well, s4on.org um, yeah. <laughs> has a lot of great uh, links to research articles. Um, also, the Massage Therapy Foundation, their journal, um, has a couple of really good oncology massage articles. My favorite thing, if this is a topic that people are interested in and want to kind of keep up on, Google Scholar, um, you can set an email alert on a topic, and I had a regular email alert on oncology massage, and get some things that are, um, I look at them and I go, okay, is this written in English? I think it's written in English. <laughs> <laughs> I like to read research, but I'm not a researcher. <laughs> yep. um, but you get a, a, all of the latest information coming out, um, and just any study that mentions oncology massage, which is very instructive for what other medical professionals are talking about and thinking about with oncology massage, um, and it's all—it seems to be pretty, um, pretty positive that they're taking this more seriously, and not just as a luxury that is safe, um, but as an integrated part of the treatment plan. Yep, and the thing is with research too, it's always changing. I mean, I mean, one day it says one thing, another day it says another thing, but it's always to keep up on it. That's the thing. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it can it can become a full time job if you let it. So I'll freely admit that that um, I have a backlog of things I want to read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, there's a holiday coming up. Maybe I'll catch up. <laughs> yeah. And and um, if you become a member of Society of um, Oncology Massage, do you get up um updates and stuff whenever those major things happen and stuff too, or? Yeah, absolutely. You get updates on what's going on in the world of oncology massage. Um, and uh, in order to become a, a member, um, it's uh, just taking that, that minimum level of 
an education requirement and you can become an approved provider on their therapist locator. Um, it's, I think it's $75 a year for a membership, which, you know, compared to other professional societies, is a huge bargain for everything that you get um, from that organization. Yeah, definitely. And then with the conference too, and are they going to continue just doing it every three years then, or are they going to up that? Or As far as I know, every three years is the plan right now. Okay. We'll see. Yep. And um, are you teaching teaching it now then too? I am um, assisting in classes for Breathe the Day. Um, I'm working towards teaching it myself. It's one of those things that, that I feel like it's, it's so important that um, – I, I need to spend a lot more time <laughs> yeah. before I feel ready to teach it. But I teach um, in a, a general massage therapy school, and um, one of the classes I teach talks about a lot of different adaptations for massage, um, one of which is massaging cancer. So that day, the way I teach it is um, pretty jam-packed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, I know from experience, I mean, teaching in massage school, I mean, you have to throw so much at them all the time. And <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but nobody leaves my class with, without knowing about the lymphatic function. Yep. Okay. That's <laughs> <laughs> your requirement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you see uh, massage students um, still scared these days and stuff like that of uh, massaging cancer, uh, pe people with cancer? And that, that is interesting. They are, but it, it comes out as um, so a lot of our students, at least lately, have been very young. Um, it comes out as bravado that scares me, I think, more than it scares them. Um, <laughs> because, it, you know, with that, there's the, okay, you need to, to not be so confident and listen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think there is, and, and there's the, the fear of doing wrong. Um, uh, the fear of breaking <laughs> someone. Um, and I think the more information they get, like the day that I teach oncology massage, the day that I teach them about cancer um, and massage, they start the day a little bit afraid and they end the day terrified. It, that's not my intention, but um, you know, the more you know, you, the more you realize how mindful you need to be and how you really need to ask a lot of questions. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And and do you think um, hospitals are requiring um, certification or certain knowledge base and stuff like that for um, working in a hospital? Some are, and I wish they all did. Um, but <laughs> the ones that I've communicated with are um, require, requiring that people have at least the minimum standard that Society for Oncology Massage has set, which is that 24-hour, that um, minimum 24-hour um, basic class. Um, and some are requiring more. They're requiring experience, which I'm not, still haven't figured out how you get experience working in a hospital environment if you are applying to yep. <laughs> You know. <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> And, and do you know anything about um, overseas, um, if, if people are massaging a lot, uh, the, the people with cancer then? And... I don't know much um, about many places. I happen to have family in England, and um, it is gaining traction, at least at least in England, um, in Britain. Uh, Britain does a lot more complimentary stuff than we do in general, um, and massage is is gaining a lot more traction. I, I still think it's more um, mainstream here, honestly, than it is in, in, in Britain, at least. Other countries, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I heard from people that I interviewed over there, too. It's it's starting to, but it's not there yet. And I mean, with, with the actual massage in general and stuff, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a little bit harder to, um, to talk people into it and stuff, but it'll come around, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and um, what kind of what what kind of hopes and dreams do you have for the oncology um, um, and massage and stuff? Oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I really 
hope that the Society for Oncology Massage continues on the path that they've um, started to forge, especially in the last few years, of um, really being a, a leader and an innovator um, and bring in an organization that brings people together um, so that we can all share knowledge and, and um, have a similar knowledge base. I hope that, um, can I answer this with a story? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> okay. um, I have a regular client who's a breast cancer survivor um, and had multiple lymph nodes removed. And I also do manual lymphatic drainage. So um, I do a lot of manual lymphatic drainage with her. Um, and we've talked a lot about, you know, uh, she's a, a more than five year survivor and have talked a lot about how this is a lifelong adaptation, et cetera, et cetera. She's moving um, out west, I think to Colorado somewhere. And so I was talking to her about um, what she needed to look for in a therapist out there and what kind of training. Um, this is the training that I had and you know, this is what I would recommend that you look for. And um, she's been out there a few times to kind of get stuff ready. And as she goes out there, sort of looks around for a therapist. And she is having a really hard time finding someone um, with the same kind of trainings and qualifications. This is what she's telling me. Um, she's a pretty thorough researcher. <laughs> <laughs> too. Um, I would, my hope is that that, that never happens, that there's enough people who are trained and qualified and have experience and um, are willing to do this work that um, someone can move from you know big metropolitan city like Chicago out to Colorado and still be able to receive their massage. Because um, for her, this is really part of her health care. Yep, definitely. Yeah, and the thing is, people relate so much more to stories, too, and stuff like that. So the more stories you have... And <laughs> Yeah. Well, this is this is my other hope is that, that we, um, as a nation in general, as a people, get comfortable get more comfortable with the idea of dying. Um, especially if this is if oncology massage is the kind of work that people are thinking about doing, uh, that we don't focus on. Um, you know, curing and getting rid of cancer, and not that that's not good, um, but that we focus on this human being right now and what they need. Uh, here's my story about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, within like the first, I'd say six to eight months that I worked at the cancer treatment center, there was a patient there who I saw every time he received chemotherapy, and uh, it's just you know, a good old Chicago guy, you know, like the ghosty the bears. <laughs> You did that too good, yeah. <laughs> and then he had so much fun with his massage um, that was usually just him lying supine and it was usually just feet and hands because he had pancreatic cancer. Um, and it was pretty advanced. So there was a lot of precaution taken with him. Um, but we would have a good time. You know, we talked about the cats and the bears and the bulls and all of that. Um, <laughs> but, um, one day he he came into the he came into the center and he was really like his whole thing was I am gonna beat this I am gonna live he went to work every day um, even as he lost like 50 pounds in two months it was, he was really determined um, but he came in one day and it was pretty clear that he was dying and soon um, he had jaundice like incredible jaundice um, so he came in with his wife and. He sat down in his chemo cubicle, thought he was going to get chemo, <laughs> crazy jaundice and thought he was going to get chemo, no. um, and his wife went to the doctor's office with the doctor and a couple of nurses to talk to them about hospice because he didn't want to hear it. Um, so that I went and sat down with him and you know, one of the nurses had said to me, you know, you think you could just massage his feet or something? And, I think that would make him feel better, so he's in his recliner, and I just, um, 
He sat down on my stool at his feet. He's got his feet up and just kind of put my hands on his feet. And, um, he's sitting in the sun, and I told him he looked like a happy cat, and he smiled, and he was just kind of from in and out of consciousness, in and out of sleep. Um, and I had a moment where I was holding his feet, and I looked at him, and the thought just like dropped into my head, this is his last massage, like capital L, last massage <laughs> of his life. Um, and the first impulse is, I can't, I can't who am I? I can't do that. <laughs> we need somebody better. Um, <laughs> so I, this is all, you know, crazy going on in my head, and I was just holding his feet and just trying to model calm, be outwardly calm. Um, and, you know, got let that go and got to the place where it, it's not about this is his last massage and how that makes me feel. It's like, here's this person who's sitting in the sun, and when you touch his feet, he feels good. So keep touching his feet. Um, so the point of that story is that one of my hopes is that um, we – as massage therapists, and especially the new massage therapists that I'm working, that I'm teaching, continue to work on getting to that place, getting through um, the difficult emotional things that can happen with our clients who are going through um, facing death, and that we get comfortable enough with death to sit with someone who is sitting with death and to, to provide comfort for them. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, because, and, and when I first started working in nursing homes at age 16, I mean, death scared me to death, but now it, it doesn't. I mean, I just try to, I, I actually love the elderly. That's my favorite population and stuff, and I love hearing their stories and stuff, and even if they tell it 20 or 30 times, I still love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I hear that story, <laughs> 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 and, and what can we expect from you out of the future, then? Oh, well, I am going to take over the world. Yeah. <laughs> you can acknowledge me now. Yeah. <laughs> Massage um, training, working on um, working with people who um, are developing curriculum, um, working more with with Greet the Day um, on their curriculum, and hopefully teaching for them at some point. Um, I am doing a lot of writing. Uh, the website that I gave you is, is my my blog, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of writing about massage therapy, about the profession, about teaching. Um, just storytelling, um, I, and my uh, practice here will be doing a lot more community outreach um, with one of my colleagues. We're going to be doing a lot more community outreach, educating um, potential patients, clients, caregivers about oncology massage, how it can help their loved ones, um, and just teaching them simple things that they can do. Because family members, too, family members get scared to touch somebody with cancer. Yep. Uh, because they don't want to break our work. Um, so teaching people that, that yeah, you can, you can touch somebody. It's it's actually okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you're scared to, here's here's a protocol you can follow. Up. Start with that. Yep. And, and I expect you to teach um, at the next conference then for Society on Ecology of Massage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will teach my class on um, world domination level one. Okay. <laughs> I will definitely take that. <laughs> Is it okay if I videotape it too? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, you got three years to decide it, so. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's been a blast. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, and keep on in the oncology world. So, yep. Absolutely, and we'll see you at the conference then. Yep, definitely. And thanks everybody for tuning in. <laughs>